I'm on Pevensey Bay in Sussex in the south of England. Nine and a half centuries ago, William, Duke of Normandy, landed here with an army of Normans. Two weeks later, William met Harold Godwinson's Saxon army on Senlac Hill near Hastings. Although Harold had the tactically advantageous higher ground, he was defeated. William and his Norman forces had successfully broken the Saxon shield wall and Harold was killed. This series is not about the Norman invasion and the Battle of Hastings itself, but about the story of how William secured his newly founded kingdom after his victory in 1066. It is a story of conquest and strategic restructuring, but also of brutality and death. It is a story of numerous remarkable methods William used to control England. And where better place to start than William's castle building campaigns? Duke William, first castles that he built were in the, the initial period of the Norman conquest, the campaigns around the Battle of Hastings. As soon as William's forces landed, he fortified a site at Pevensey. We think that he, he made a castle within um, an existing Roman fortification and then built what seems to have been a Mott castle at Hastings. So we have those very early castles that are built as part of the first Norman campaigns. Um, but then as Norman control expands across England, William strategically builds castles in the main centres, the main administrative centres, population centres, uh, centres of government across England. I have come to Blackpush Airport, where I hope a different perspective on England from the sky can help me appreciate and understand the sheer scale and task of controlling such a country. I've just flown over the English Channel and I'm now in England over Hastings. The same journey William once made in 1066, but by sea. From up here, you get a real sense of just how much land William had to control. Within weeks of the Norman invasion, castles were being built, and it's said that just 50 years into the Norman reign, they had established well over 500. These were built in strategic locations, like at river crossings or near passes through hills and mountains. And in built up or rebellious areas, castles were spaced at 32 kilometer intervals so that if an area was under attack, Norman troops could travel to that location to help out their fellow soldiers. Castles dominate the landscape militarily. Castles are bases for, for garrisons, and certainly in the Norman period, they had important functions for horsemen for containing stables so cavalry could move quickly around the hinterland of a castle. But castles also controlled the landscape in another very important way. They controlled the countryside. Castles are also centres of landholding and centres of lordship. They're centres where the countryside would be managed and administered. There's a big difference here between the Anglo-Saxon birds, which is essentially where you have your town and everyone lives essentially together in big houses, small houses, and there's a wall around the town. Normans, perhaps fearing, you know, the fact that they were a minority, a ruling minority in England, don't live like that, they live separately. Castle building could have really disastrous consequences for a town. We know from Doomsday Book that houses are demolished. We know from archeology span that castles were sometimes superimposed on streets, upon the urban fabric that was clear to make way for these new symbols of Norman power. These castles had several defining key features. The Mott was a large mound of earth, typically five to seven metres high. With enough locally conscripted peasant labour, they were quick to build. This would be topped with a wooden structure called a keep. These would later be replaced by enormous stone towers. The bailey was the enclosure that surrounded the mot, usually where a Norman lord and his soldiers lived. The 
The next stage of my journey has brought me to Old Buckingham, a village in Norfolk. Here I'm going to see a later Norman Mott and Bailey castle and I'm meeting local history expert Anthony Cardi who's showing me around the site. Hello. Hello Jack. Welcome to New Buckingham Castle. Thank I'm you sure very you're much. going to enjoy it. We'll Thank go inside. You. The owners have given us special access to look around. So what are we currently walking over then? We're walking over the bridge, over the moat, wooden bridge originally, deep moat, which went right round the castle. And also the bridge would have been protected by a stone gatehouse, the remains of which are still here. Mott and Bailey castles typically had a ditch surrounding the castle as a layer of defence. And as Anthony said, this one in Norfolk was filled with water and still is, making it a moat. So what are we currently walking into now then? We're walking into the inner bailey of the castle, which was surrounded and protected by a massive earthwork right round the circumference. And that would have been, in those days, bare earth. None of the trees which are obviously there now would have been here. But on top of that bank would have been a wooden fence known as a palisade as a defensive instrument, yeah. which would keep people out. And what would have happened inside the bailey? Well, that would have been where the uh, Norman soldiers lived. Their barracks, stables, the blacksmith shops, any other workhouses and things like that. Everything to do with keeping a small Norman army active and ready for purpose. Absolutely. Yeah. So obviously the heart of the castle would have been the stone keep. Yes. What is so special about this one? Well, it's the first round keep in, built in England after the conquest. And the reason it's built round is because of, it's built of flint and it was very difficult to build square buildings of flint. And it was literally the first one in the country. All the others on the top of Mott, for instance, started off being wood and then were replaced with stone gradually. It couldn't be built of stone at first because the weight of the stone of would course. have brought the, uh, the, the uh, Mott down. Yeah. But this one is quite low, so you know, the weight wouldn't have affected the, um, the underground very yeah. much. And obviously the Norman Lord would have lived here. Yes. So, so who was the Norman Lord that lived at, at Buckingham? He was William Dalbini. His father had come over uh, with William the Conqueror and had then been rewarded with lands in Norfolk. Castles were again symbols of, of um, colonisation, symbols of power, of a takeover of a new regime. Castles were effective tools of control for uh, numerous reasons. Um, firstly, defensively, they're good when people are rebelling, when the Lord wants to be saved from the local people, um, when an invasion force comes along, you can hole up in your castle and last there long enough until someone shows up to help you out. Um, but they're also important in terms of power. This is where the local Lord, Sheriff, Castellan, someone like that sits and rules. You know, this is where the law is um, sort of emanating from. It's also where the money's kept a lot of the time. So your taxes are literally kept in the safest place possible. So it's symbolically and practically this place where power is sort of emanating from and power is practiced. His regime is seizing control of Anglo-Saxon England. He's seizing control of centres of government, wanting to make the mark of the new Norman regime on the conquered territories. Um, castles are also very, very clearly symbolic of, of Norman control, the arrival of a new power, a new regime. Here you've got a very symbolic um, demonstration that this is where the wealth is, this is where the power is. That really does kind of shift the way society works. The skyline would have been dominated by these Norman symbols of control, changing the landscape of England. The Anglo-Saxons had never seen something like this before, as it was a complete militarisation of the country. William clearly made the point of under new management, designed to intimidate the local communities and constantly remind them of who was now in charge. William's Mott and Baileys remain scattered across England today. Some are amongst the countryside, like Tottenhoe Castle in Bedfordshire and Hayward Castle in Devon, where the natural surroundings would have been similar to that of the 11th century. 
Some are privately owned, like Toddington Castle in Bedfordshire, Clifford Castle in Herefordshire, and Tremayton Castle in Cornwall, where people have built modern homes and farms and live inside the Baileys. What is sure though is that these ruins are powerful reminders of William's legacy and how the Norman conquest changed England forever.